Only in that relationship with our Heavenly Father do we find everything that satisfies us, and so He is our great priority. Welcome to Corinth Baptist Church Sunday Worship Services with Pastor Teacher Joey Carroll. When pastors fall into sin, they gouge out the road of the gospel. If you're born again, and yet you are unrepentant in sin, and unwilling to deal with sin in your life, you're gouging out the road to advance the gospel. Last week we were walking, or began to walk through, and we kind of started at chapter 2 because remember I told you I wanted to look at the exhortation of chapter 2, verse 1, where the author or the writer of Hebrews says, For this reason we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard, recall, so that we don't what? Drift away. And it's the danger of this drifting that he begins this first warning passage that he sends to us because he does not want the people of God, the children of God, to begin drifting away from this gospel about the Son of God that they've heard. And you know, we said last week also that drifting was in the passive voice, meaning it just happens. It's continually happening to you if you fail to recognize it. You're, I know you guys go to the beach and you've been to the beach and you, you know what I talk about when I use the, the, the word undertow. And you know, they got the flag system up there and if you see the red flag, that tells you you need to be very, very, very careful because the undertow is so strong. It's pulling you away from where you want to be safely on shore, right? Well, there's always a red flag hanging over your faith. There's always a pull, there's always a draw that's pulling you away from where you want to be in your foundation in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we don't live passively in our Christian faith. We live actively in our Christian faith so that we will not begin to drift away from this gospel that we know. And he's so many times in this book of Hebrews, he throws up these red flags to us. In chapter 2, verse 1, where he says, pay attention to Jesus. In chapter 3, verse 1, he says, consider Jesus. In chapter 12, verse 2, he says, fix your eyes on Jesus. So it's a constant realization that if we lose sight of our Lord, for whatever reason, they don't have to be bad reasons. They can be perfectly good reasons. But the moment that we take our eyes off our Lord, we begin to drift out to sea. And so we have to be so careful with our faith. And so he makes all these statements in verse 1 that I want to look at this morning. And then he comes to the conclusion in verse 2 and he says, For this reason. So what's the reason? That's what he tells us. In the first part of chapter 1, he begins to describe how Jesus Christ relates to God. And he comes to this conclusion. He's equal. In the second half of chapter 1, he begins to show us how Christ relates to the angels. That's bizarre for us, but I'll explain. But he comes to the conclusion Jesus is better than the angels. We get over to chapter 4, he begins to show how Jesus is better than Moses. Then he goes how Jesus is better than Aaron, Moses' priest. Then he talks about how the covenant that Jesus purchased is a better covenant. And then he talks about the sacrifice of Christ. The sacrifice that Christ made on the cross for us is a better sacrifice. So he makes all these comparisons throughout this whole book and he gets to the end of the comparison and he goes, Christ is better. Christ is better. Christ is better. And we may hear that and we may understand that in our minds, but what happens to our life when we really take a hold of the idea that Christ is better? All of a sudden, all of our distractions and struggles begin to fall by the wayside because we've seen what is valuable and we grab a hold of what is valuable. So I want to walk through these passages this morning in chapter 1. But first, let me tell you what our challenge is. Let me set this on the table first. Here's our problem. Religion is not a part of our culture. It was a part of the culture that who this book was written to. Religion was their entire culture. Hence, he's going to address angels. Now, probably... You don't think very much about angels at all. You may have gone through the entire week this week without ever thinking about an angel. But you've got to understand, for the Jewish people, that was not the case. The angels were second only to God. 
And so he's going in a very systematic way. He's going to bring up God first. Then he's going to go to what's second most important, angels. And he's going to draw this comparison to Christ. So you're not going to care a whole lot about the details of the angels per se, but don't let me lose you because the principle is always unchanging. You see, you do have things in your life that have a dangerous level of priority that you need to stop and compare it to Christ. You do have things in your life that you recognize a little too much that you need to stop and compare to Christ. So even though we're going to go, okay, angels, I don't get that, but you do get this. There's something in your life that you've misplaced or misvalued, rather. There's something that you've elevated too highly that you need to recognize that Christ is so much more valuable than that. Really, in reality, that thing is, is insignificant. And if you'll do that, you don't have to worry about what happening to your faith. This drift that is constantly going on because you valued Christ so highly, you have tied yourself off. Remember the moorings last week? You've tied yourself off to Christ and you're not going anywhere. That is the kind of life that we own. So let's walk through these passages and I'll show you how he relates everything to Christ, but then we'll come back to that same thought. Let me read the first four passages and we'll see how he relates to number one. God the Father, right? God, after He spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days, God has spoken to us in His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the world. And Christ is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His nature. And He upholds all things by the word of His power. When Christ had made purification of sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels, here He goes, as He has inherited a more excellent name than they. Now He's going to draw this comparison, but we understand when we compare Christ, the Son of God, to God the Father, it's one of equality. We've seen that so many times, particularly in the Gospel of John. But let me show you how He does this. And we did this... Um, when the snow, when we had the snow, but there was just a handful of people here. So I want to walk back through this and a little more carefully, let's look at this. But first he says, regarding the prophets, and what did the job of the prophets do? They delivered to us the word of God, right? But the problem was in the Old Testament, it was always bits and pieces. It was never a whole picture. And so when Christ came, He gave us the whole picture. He took all the pieces of the puzzle and He laid them out and He put it together and we could see the fullness of the picture. That's why it says in verse 2, in these last days God has spoken to us in Son. That's what it literally says. So when we saw the Son, we heard the fullness of what God was saying to us. So Jesus is better than all the Old Testament prophets, but He's also better than all the angels. And we'll look at these passages probably next week. But the Bible says that the, I mean, that the angels served as some sort of mediator when God gave the law to Moses. I don't know exactly how this worked out, but in some sense the angels were present and when God delivered to Moses those Ten Commandments and the law of God, those angels mediated that exchange. And so the author knows that. In fact, he, he refers to that in chapter 2, but he says, listen, he's better than the prophets, he's better than the angels. Okay? So he's incomparably better than most of these. Then he goes and he talks about his position. Now remember, I told you in Hebrew literature they do this, right? Beginning, end, and they begin to walk toward the middle until they get to the ta-da, this is what I really want to say. He begins to talk about the position of Christ. Look at this, he's the heir of all things. God has appointed Christ Lord over all things. He owns it all. He rules it all. And by the way, that should have implications for your life because He owns your life. He owns every bit of it. That should reflect in how we act, right? Because you have a Lord. He has been appointed heir. Look at what also, as far as His position... He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And we all know what a right hand man means. And it's the same principle here. Jesus sits at the right hand, the place of prominence, the place of preeminence, the place of priority. 
Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Another picture of His Lordship. I don't know why, but so many of us struggle with Lordship. I know John MacArthur wrote a book several years ago that he got in a whole lot of trouble for because he talked about the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And people begin to shout, oh, you're talking about works. That's not works. That's reality. He's Lord. He is Lord of my life. He is Lord of your life. MacArthur goes on to say he's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. (laughs) And I understand what he's saying, but that's a scary thought, right? But he's Lord. And when we have something in our lives that don't line up with what he has said in his word, how should we respond? In repentance, right? This doesn't fit with what my Lord has said. Therefore, I walk in repentance. So this is the work of Christ. I mean, that's the position of Christ. Now let's look at the work of Christ, through whom also God made the world. In some way, God spoke, and through Christ, everything was created. God made the world through Christ. All things were made through Him and for Him and by Him, right? That's what Colossians says. So this was His creative work, and now look at His redemptive work as we draw toward the middle. He made purification of sins. Christ is the perfect superior priest in one act. Now this doesn't hit you guys as well because you're not Jewish either, but we don't understand how much of the sacrificial system involved their religious culture. Every day animals are dying to pay for the sin. And once a year on the Day of Atonement, hundreds of animals were slain and blood was spilled all over the animal to make atonement for the sins of the people, right? And it never satisfied God, the writer of Hebrews will tell us in chapter 10. They never did a thing. They were simply to point to a day when one sacrifice would be made and Christ would make purification of sin. That happened on the day He died on the cross for you and for me. So that's His work, His position, His work. And now his essence. This is who he is. Look what he says. He is the radiance of God's glory. And he is the exact representation of God's nature. And he upholds all things by the word of his power. And we talked about this a few weeks ago. I spent quite a bit of time here. Um, Paul refers to Christ as the face of God. In fact, Jesus said to the disciples himself the night before he was crucified, if you know me, you've known the Father. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. He is the exact representation. And when he refers to he's the radiance of God's glory, that's the outshining, right? I love this picture. Jesus is the outshining glory of God. But look what also, also it says. He's the exact representation of his nature. His nature is his inner, his inner personality, his inner character. And when we put these two together, Christ is the picture of God outside and in. And from inside out, they're equal. They're not the same person, but they're equal. He's fully God. Okay? That's the biggest comparison that he wants to make. So when you tell a Jew... That Christ is equal to God. You've taken the number one place of God the Father and, say, and you say the Son stands exactly next to Him. And then He goes on in verse 4. And then He begins this number 2. He starts walking through these angels. He says, Having become as much better than the angels as He has inherited a more excellent name than they. Now, you know I'm a sucker for grammar. And here is the grammar for you. I wish I had time to walk through all these verbs, but y'all would fall asleep on me. But by the way, this word inherited is in perfect tense. It's the only one through here. And you remember, I've told you this, but let me remind you, right? Perfect tense. Something happened in the past, and the effects continue today. What happened in the past? God gave him a name. When did that take place? The Bible says in Philippians 2, 9, For this reason, referring to the cross, for this reason God highly exalted Him 
and bestowed on Him the name which is above every name, so at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is what? Lord. You see, there was a day where Christ inherited a name in the perfect tense and the effects of that continue today. He still holds that name and there is no other name higher. The name of Jesus Christ. It will forever be the most prominent, preeminent name. And He has a name bigger than the angels or better than the angels. Now look at verse 5. He says... For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son? Which one? No one. He never said that to anybody but one. In fact, look at verse 13 very quickly if you're still at chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13. He begins and ends this whole section with the same thought, same phrase. But to which of the angels has he ever said? None. That's the point. And it's even a voice of sarcasm. Who did he say that to? Nobody. Nobody but one. And it was the Son of God. And you think about this, you say, wait a minute, aren't we sons and daughters of God? Isn't that what John says, that we're the children of God? Yes, but there's still only one Son. In fact, in the Old Testament, it calls the angels the sons of God. But there's still only one son. You see, we're not sons and daughters of God unless we're in the son. And when we receive Christ, we receive his sonship. So technically, are you a son and daughter of God? Well, only if you're in Christ. But if you're in Christ, you are. But there's still only one son of God. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've got your Bibles, go back to Psalms chapter 2. Hold your finger there because we'll be back to Hebrews in just a second. But go go in the middle of your Bible and you'll hit the book of Psalms and look at at Psalms 2. Let me just read the whole psalm. I pointed out several weeks ago, and you probably have have forgotten, but he walks through seven on purpose. He quotes seven Old Testament passages, and each of these passages he compares Jesus to angels, but also in each of these passages he talks about or points to the enthronement of Christ, where Christ is seated as king. Okay, We'll only read one of these. I won't carry through all seven, but Psalms 2 is a beautiful Uh, We have no idea who wrote it, but you'll see the sun in just a second. Psalms 2, verse 1, he says, Why are the nations in an uproar, and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart, let us cast their cords from us. Now look what God does. Verse 4. He who sits in the heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then He will speak to them in His anger and terrify them in His fury, saying, As for me, I have installed my what? King. God says, I've set my king on the throne, and His name is Jesus Christ. Upon Zion, my holy mountain. Look at verse 7. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give you the nations as your inheritance, the very ends of the earth as your possessions. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now therefore, O kings, he goes back to the kings of the earth, show discernment or wise up. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son. It literally says, kiss the Son, that He not become angry and you perish in the way. For His wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in Him. It's the sonship, it's the kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all the way back to Psalms 2, God says, you better literally 
kiss my son, you better worship my son. If you don't worship my son, you will not enter into God's presence. My son. Of course, this is not the first time we've heard this, right? Remember Jesus' baptism? John baptized our Lord Jesus. When he came up out of the water, what did God say? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This is a big deal. God had one. And you better pay attention to him. For my wife, let me paint an analogy so I won't lose you. For my wife to have a kinship or be kin to or relationship with my father, there's only one way for her to do that. She's got to marry my father's son. That's the only way my wife could have a relationship or be kin to my father. She had to kiss the son, right? The only way for you to have a relationship with God the Father is for you to marry the son. It's for you to say, Jesus, I do. I take you, all of you. I long to be your bride. I long to give my life. Last night we were at our marriage group and we were talking about how you know, the people we marry are these lost, wicked-hearted sinners. I mean, they are apart from Christ, right? But when they come to Christ, what beautiful things He does, how He changes them, Right? And so we can have this relationship now. But here's what's so significant about that. It's the only relationship, right, we promise to God that we'll ever have. We say, I'm going to spend the only life that I have with you. That's what I want to do. It's pretty remarkable. I told him last night weeping, I can't believe my wife decided to spend the only one life that she has with me. I would call that a mistake. But she just had one and she gave it to me. Can I tell you this? You just have one. It's eternal, by the way. If I were you, I would give it to Christ. In order that you might have a relationship with God the Father, won't you please wed the Son and give your life to Him? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. And so when we see this Son... Don't bypass that. That's huge. The father only had one. And you don't want to be an old maid without a husband. You better marry the one that God had and gave to you and gave on our behalf when he died on the cross. When he says the phrase, today I have begotten you, of course he's referring to when that God, Jesus Christ, became a man and he became the God-man. And then he repeats himself in verse 5 and he says, And again, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. He quotes 2 Samuel 7, 14. When he gets to verse 6, he uses a word that many churches teach heresy with. Look at verse 6. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, referring to Christ's coming, he says, let all the angels of God, what? Worship Him. Now, this word firstborn is the word prototokos. Um, every religion makes its mistake here. Because they look at that English word and they translate it and understand it as firstborn. For example, the Mormons do. They relate Jesus Christ as a brother to Satan and the other angels, uh, but basing this on this firstborn. Uh, the Jehovah's Witness looked to Christ as not being God, always God, that He was born, that He was created by Christ. And certainly when we look at this word and we see it in English, we think firstborn, okay, He must have been born, which in, in, in fact, it's a little bit true, right? He was God, but He was born a what? He was born a man. But the word is not firstborn. In the Greek, it's prototokos, which has nothing to do with time. It has nothing to do with being physically born. It has to do with place. 
Prototokos is a place of honor. It's a place of preeminence. It's a place of importance. Hence, the firstborn son received what from the father when he died? Everything. If dad had a business and dad died, who got the business? The son. So when he talks about firstborn, he's talking about this is the one of prominence. This is the one that has the highest place, not the one that was born, that was created. Let me show you this. Turn to Psalm 89. You really need to get this because, like I said, everybody misses this because they're reading this in English and thinking Christ was born. He was created, but he was not. John tells us that. But we can see this word in Psalms 89, 89, 27. The Word of God says in Psalms 89, 27, He said, I also shall make Him my firstborn, and then He explains it, the highest of the kings of the earth. That's our word. That's what He's referring to when we get to the New Testament in Prototokos. He has the highest place. He has the place of preeminence or the importance. But look what He says of the angels. Back in Hebrews 1.6. And let all the angels of God worship Him. We will all worship Him. Even those created beings, and you do realize everything was created through Christ, so Christ created the angels, and they will all worship Him. Let me tell you just a little bit about this angel bit before we move on. The Jews were very messed up on this, and so I imagine when the writer of Hebrews said, let all the angels of God worship Him, they began to stumble at that point quite a bit. In Genesis 1.26, you remember where God says, let us make man in our image, in our image, He created them. Remember all that plural stuff? We talked about the triune God. Well, for some of the Jews, they believed that was an angelic council that God met with and made all His decisions with. And this angelic council decided that God would make them in His image. They also believe that there's 200 angels that control the movements of the stars. Again, none of this is in Scripture. They believe that there's a calendar angel that helps the calendar run. I don't know if he helps the app run on our iPhone, but there is an angel that helps the calendar run. There's an angel of frost, dew, rain, snow, hail, thunder, and lightning. Every season, every bit of weather has its own angels, they thought. There's angels that reside in hell and they're the wardens of hell. There's an angel that writes down every single word we say. For some of you, that angel may be overworked and underpaid. I don't know. It led Paul to say in Colossians 2.18, if you've got your Bibles, back up to the left and look at this. Colossians 2.18, this is why Paul makes this bizarre statement. That we kind of look at funny. Colossians 2.18 says, Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of what? Angels. You see, some of them even worshipped the angels. I know a lady that did. Making a delivery one day. She called and said, would you bring about this by my house on your way home? And I said, sure. And I walked in the room, and I've never seen anything like that in my life. It was scary. Hundreds of angels, all shapes and sizes, all over her house. And she could tell I was looking funny. She says, I really love angels. I was like, yeah, you do. It's borderline weird. But that's what they did. They worshiped these angelic beings. And if you remember, don't think I'd never do that because twice in the book of Revelations, when John's writing Revelation, an angel walks up to John to talk to him and John immediately, the Bible says, falls on his face and worships them. Do you remember what the angel said both times he did that? Don't do that. I love that. Don't do that. Dude, get up. You don't worship me. Even angels know that. Of course, there's some who didn't know that. Satan, right? That's why he was cast out of heaven. 
But the rest of them that stayed with the Father know exactly, don't you dare worship me, but yet you and I would be drawn to do that. So it's not quite as simple and foolish as we're talking about because John did it twice. And so when the writer says in verse 6, let all the angels of God worship him, you understand that trumps the idea that angels are number two. No, they're not. They're not even close. In fact, they worship the Son. In fact, in verse 7, this is an unusual phrase, but he says, And of all the angels, he says, He makes His angels winds and His ministers of flames of fire. In other words, Jesus has a place of privilege and they have a place of service. They were made to serve. That was their job. Look at verse 14 if you're still in chapter 1. Referring to the angels, the writer says, Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation. That's their job. They're servants. There is no angelic counsel. Christ is better. Okay? The last couple of passages here. Verse 8, verse 9. But of the Son, He says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. What did God the Father just call the Son? Don't miss that. What did He call Him? God. Do you know that? God the Father called the Son God. You see, He has inherited a name. That's a more excellent name. He refers to Him as my Son. He refers to Him as O God. He's got a big name. He says, you are forever and ever. In other words, you're eternal. The righteous scepter is the scepter of His kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. The early church said to deny the Trinity was to deny the faith. faith, And I believe that with all my heart. There is God the Father, there is God the Son, and there is God the Holy Spirit. They're equally God, but they're different in person. And God uses this analogy. And we won't use it in heaven, but we have it here for our sake. There's a Father, there's a Son, and there's a Spirit. And He just did that so we could somehow grasp the Trinity of God with a Father and a Son and a Spirit. But he's got some more name. He is the one and only Son of God, and he is God. And in the last three passages, look what he calls him. And you, Lord, he's my Son, he is God, and he is Lord. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, And the heavens are the works of your hands. Look at this. The heavens and the earth, they will perish, but you remain. They will become like an old shirt that you throw away. And like a a shawl or a mantle, you'll roll them up. Like a garment, they will also be changed. But you, you are the same. And your years will not come to an end. Your years will not come to an end. Let me ask you this, and I just thought of this passing through. If Jesus Christ and God the Father never changes. What about their word? So many people take that book in your lap today and say, Oh, it's changed. This is a different culture. It doesn't mean that. It means this today. Well, if God has never changed, nor has His Son, what what makes you think that His word would ever change? It is always the same. He is the Son, He is God, and He is Lord. And look how He concludes this thought. But to which of the angels has He ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. This is the second time He's referred to the phrase of sit at your right hand. And it's interesting to know that there's no one else seated. The angels aren't seated. Nobody in heaven is seated. They're up worshiping. They're up praising. But there are two that are seated. It's God the Father and the Son. Do you know why they're seated? Because their work is finished. God sat down on that seventh day and rested, right? 
Jesus died for my sin and for your sin, ascended into heaven, and took his seat at the right hand of the Father because his work was finished. He stood up one time in Scripture that we'll talk about tonight. It's a very powerful moment when the Son stood, but for the rest of the time, he, has, he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And for a Jew, when you say that, they understood very clearly that there's no one higher than the Son because He is seated at the same level as God the Father. Now, here's my thought for you as we close. Number one, if you don't know the Son, there is no one else. There is no opportunity for you to have a relationship with the Father unless you go through the one and only Son. My second thought for you, if you know the Son and have a relationship with the Father through the Son, you need not forget that He is not only the Son, but He is also God and He is also Lord, and that has an implication on how you live your life. It is not your life. It is His. He is Lord. My third and final thought for you, if you know Him and have a relationship with the Father through the Son, you need to make some comparisons. I need to make some comparisons. I know we don't struggle with angels. Nobody in here came in here this morning thinking, well, you know, the angels are higher than Jesus. It never crossed your mind. But I do know this about you because you're just like me. There are things in your life where you might say they're not higher than Christ, but if we really sat down and watched a YouTube video of your life, we would begin to think that there are some things in your life that are higher than Christ. By the things you do, they don't have to be bad. By the things you say, by the amount of time that you spend, we could watch that video and go, you know, friend, I believe what we're seeing is you have something in your life that's taken priority and precedent over Christ. You need to make some comparisons. Because there's no other name that's higher. There's no other person or thing that holds more value than the Lord Jesus Christ. He is of infinite value. Let's pray.